Uh, anyway, our next speaker is Annalyn Newitz. She's going to talk about the future of journalism. Uh, since she's the lead editor of io9.com and has written some quite extensively about the future, according to her, heaven will be fine, but the future not so much. Um, and I'm looking forward to what she will tell us about the new future of journalism. Annalyn Newitz. Well, you hear a lot uh, in the media these days, because of course the media likes to talk about itself, that um, journalism is dying. And the premise of my talk is that that's bullshit. Um, and this is an issue that's actually um, quite important to me in my professional life, because throughout my journalism career, which has lasted a pretty long time, I don't want to quite tell you how long, but you'll figure it out in a minute, um, I've actually watched the sort of death of print media and the rise of new media, uh, although I've done it kind of backwards. Uh, the first uh, magazine that I ever worked at was an online zine called Bad Subjects, um, which we started in the early 90s on Gopher, um, which now that will tell you how long <laughs> my career has gone. Um, and uh, it was a small leftist publication that I started as a student, um, and at that time, the idea of online journalism was a kind of quirky, weird little thing. Um, and as my career went on, I moved into print journalism and uh, magazines and alternative news weeklies um, in the United States. And, um, and then, as time went on, I moved back into online media. And we've seen sort of a shift from the idea of print and magazines being viewed as mainstream media uh, to, start, to, to beginning to think of uh, online media as mainstream media. Um, and the, the site that I run now, um, io9, uh, is, which is a science and a science fiction site, um, we get about three million unique visitors a month, which is actually more than many television shows on the sci-fi network get. Um, so I feel like at that point we've reached mainstream, um, depending on how you feel about the sci-fi network. Um, so, so my career has sort of spanned this, this shift, and I've watched a lot of my colleagues, um, unfortunately very talented colleagues, losing their jobs um, as print media jobs have shrunk in the United States, um, and as magazines and newspapers have shut down, and they haven't always been able to find jobs in what weirdly gets called the new media, but what I want to argue is actually kind of a continuation of the old media. So what I'm going to do today um, is talk to you a little bit about three jobs that journalists will be doing in 50 years. Um, since I'm a blogger, I can't resist having a title that has a number in it, um, but at least I didn't say 10 jobs, which would be the ultimate uh, blog uh, post title. Um, but before we get started, and before I talk to you about these three jobs, which are fairly uh, capacious categories, I mean, I, and I'm not wedded to the, ca the names of the categories, they're really just um, ways of thinking about how journalism is going to change and how it isn't going to change. So if you want to call these jobs other things, please be my guest. Um, but before we start, I wanted to give you a quick definition of journalism, um, since we all seem to disagree about what it is. Um, this is actually a definition that I adapted from a book called The Elements of Journalism, where the authors actually have quite a long definition. It's a 10-point definition. Um, but basically, it's to bring truthful information and conscientious analysis to the public so that they can make informed decisions about their lives and communities. It is also an independent monitor of power. Um, and I think it's important to keep that in the back of your mind because remember, journalism isn't just about information. It's also about conscientious analysis, which means that in its very, built into the very definition of journalism is the idea of doing analysis bringing in your opinion and bringing in commentary. Not all journalism has to do that, but having commentary and opinion is part of the journalistic tradition. And I'll talk more about that um, throughout the, the presentation. All right, so are you ready to work uh, in 2060? Okay, here we go. Here's your job, your first job. Um, hacker journalists. Um, and actually, you could also call this job developer journalists. This is people who today and I think tomorrow will be making tools, software tools or hardware tools um, to analyze and report news. Um, I have a picture here which I guess looks a bit fuzzy from the audience, um, but it's taken from a popular show in the, well, a cult show in the 1980s called Max Headroom, um, which I urge you to watch if you've never seen it. It's about the future of journalism. 
and it's about uh, investigative reporters, and they've developed what they call a rifle camera. And so this is the 80s, so what you can see is that the cartridge is actually a VHS tape, and the trigger is the record button. And you hold the camera up, and you shoot. And when you shoot, you're recording, and you're making news. And they have a live feed that links them back to their, um, to their producer, and the producer is actually feeding them information about where they are all the time, so they actually have a kind of virtual reality overlay that they're looking at as they're kind of going into buildings and taking pictures of, of, um, of the government authorities doing terrible things. Um, in this case, actually, in this scene, uh, advertisers are doing terrible things, and this journalist gets it on tape before she's uh, murdered. So um, let me talk a little bit about a couple examples of people doing hacker journalism today. There are a ton of examples that we could use. Um, one really good one, though, was several years ago, uh, Kevin Polson, who is a Wired writer that you've probably uh, seen, you've probably seen his work. Um, he decided there were a lot of rumors at this time, like I said, this was about four years ago, there were all these rumors about how the, the MySpace was crawling with child molesters. This was back when MySpace was popular. Um, and the, there was this idea that, you know, your kid will go, <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, MySpace, um, but there was this idea that your kid would go on there and instantly he would be, you know, sucked up by all these nasty people. So Kevin said, well, hey, um, why don't I just search MySpace? Why don't I just write a simple Perl script that will look for, first he did a script to scrape the database of known sex offenders, um, and then he searched through MySpace over a period of months using a simple Perl script, which he then made available publicly on Wired.com, uh, and looked for matches. And he found um, several hundred matches of uh, convicted sex offenders who had been released who had MySpace profiles. Uh, and then he went through and looked through those profiles and found a guy who not only was a convic convicted sex offender, but he was using his MySpace profile to hook up with underage guys. Um, and there it was. All he had to do in order to do this investigation was, you know, spend, um, you know, months grinding through data using a Perl script. He could not have done that investigation without doing a tiny little bit of software development, tiny little bit of Perl script. Um, and so eventually they did, he actually went with the police when they arrested this guy. Um, and so his, his little Perl script uh, actually led to the arrest um, of somebody who was attempting to molest children and had a record of doing that. Um, another example of somebody who currently, or a group that is currently doing um, what I would consider to be hacker journalism, um, is, the, is the people behind the Ushahidi mapping platform. There was actually a great talk here a couple days ago about um, how Ushahidi was being used during the Afghanistan, the recent Afghanistan elections. Um, another way in which this was used, this is basically just a simple mapping platform that you can use to um, you can basically input data to the map from many different devices. So you can use SMS, you can use the web, you can use phone calls if you want, um, anything that you like. Um, and you can um, send reports using any, any device that you like. Um, and it was used very successfully after the Haitian earthquake um, to report um, areas where people were trapped under rubble, um, places where people needed food and water, uh, places where you could get food and water, places where you could get medical supplies. And the way that it worked uh, was that um, this group set up the map that you see here, um, and they had about 100 volunteers who were taking in this information, and they got, um, they got help from a local radio station in Haiti that would broadcast an SMS number that would allow people, and everyone has cell phones there. People don't have computers, so they can't use their little web interface, but they do have cell phones. And so they were getting all of these SMSs from people, like, I am trapped under rubble, please send help. Um, and they were also in touch with the Coast Guard, they were in touch with um, relief organizations, international organizations that were coming in to help out, uh, and they were able to create this map. And what you're seeing here in these bubbles are just incident reports. So essentially, the question is kind of who is the journalist here, because of course each of those incident reports could be looked at as an article in and of itself. Each time a person SMSs and says, over here there's a collapsed building, well that's a report of truthful information that's helpful to other people. Um, but I would actually argue that the entire process of creating the map, um, coordinating that map, and building the software, building the platform, 
um, is, is really hacker journalism because it allows people to, it allows people like us to access that information later or during the crisis. Um, and then it also allows the people involved in the crisis to communicate with each other. So it really functions exactly the way you want journalism to function. Um, and it's, it's very helpful. The other thing that's very interesting about this particular Ushahidi um, instance, and it's been used in other places too, it was used after the Kenyan uh, elections as well, is that a lot of people when they talk about Ushahidi and when they talk about projects like this, they say, it's crowdsourced, yay, the crowd will write our journalism for us. That again, to go back to my earlier point, is bullshit. Um, because what happened with the Haiti example, as with many of the other Ushahidi uses, is that they had to have a huge herd of editors to cull out all of the information that wasn't useful, to edit the information, to translate the information. They were getting tons of stuff in French, but they were also dealing with uh, aid agencies that only spoke English. Um, and the other thing that happened a lot um, in the Haiti example was that because people were getting the SMS number over the radio, they got a ton of requests for songs. So people would be like, hey, <laughs> I heard this number on the radio. Will you guys play this song? Um, now, if all of those SMS messages had gone directly to the map, you would have had Bob is under rubble, plus Sadie out on the street really wants to hear Lady Gaga. Um, which arguably is always good to know that people want to hear Lady Gaga, in my opinion, but I don't think it's really relevant to the Haitian earthquake um, in, in particular. So, um, so basically, the idea that editing is going to be phased out in 50 years, I think, is a complete misperception. And I think we're going to continue to need, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to continue need, to need editors more than ever, but they'll just be doing a very different kind of job. Um, but they'll still be editing the news and they'll be extremely necessary to make the news accurate and useful. All right, here is your next job. Data mining reporter. There's a lot of overlap between data mining reporter and hacker journalist, um, but basically my idea is that the hacker journalist base develops a kind of tool and the data mining reporter um, basically analyzes data using technology. Um, this is a picture of Mr. Universe from Serenity, uh, who is the guy that sends out um, pirate TV signals and also receives pirate TV signals. Um, so here's a, a great example, a very recent example of what I would call data mining reporting. So earlier this year we had the flash crash um, on the market when the Dow dropped like a thousand points um, in about five seconds. Um, and it was called the flash crash and everybody said, what the hell happened? Uh, we, don't, we don't understand, it was some kind of technical glitch, um, which was later um, seen to be a company that did a bunch of um, sell, sells really quickly. Uh, but one of the companies and one of the groups of analysts most responsible for figuring this out was a company called Nanex, which does financial analysis. Um, not a traditional news organization in any way, and in fact, it kind of flies in the face of our idea of news media being independent because, of course, they work for financial services companies. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing to keep in the back of your mind. Um, but there, were an, it, there was an interesting series of articles in The Atlantic online about some of the other analysis that they discovered. And basically, most people who had been analyzing um, stock trades um, were looking at it maybe at the second by second level, and that's it. But the geeks at Nanex were like, fuck that. We are like totally looking at this at the millisecond level. So they're recording millisecond by millisecond data, which allowed them to not only figure out ultimately what caused the flash crash or come up with a, a plausible story, but it also allowed them to find, kind of unrelated to that, all of this weird behavior that was being caused by robot traders. And um, no one is quite sure what these trades are, but what you can see in this graph, and actually if you, if you look up the story, if you look up like flash crash on the Atlantic, you'll find this. Um, this, is, this is one second of trading um, and what's happening are robots are asking for quotes um, over this, sorry, this is 12 seconds of trading. So they made a total of 10,000 asks, basically, um, over 12 seconds. 
Um, and this is what the graph looks like, is like sort of the, the, um, the asks are going up in price and back down and up in price. But this is happening, like I said, at like the millisecond level. And no, and, and no one is quite sure what's going on, but Nanex is now sort of launching a long-term investigation into what is this people trying to send junk data into the market? Is it just weird emergent behavior that happens because there's all these robots trading and doing asks and, and kind of just playing around? They don't know, but now this is the beginning of what we would call a classic investigative journalist story. They've discovered a weird piece of behavior it's affecting financial markets. It's probably related to part of what happened that caused the flash crash. And now they're producing data. And again, they could only have done that using um, data mining techniques. Um, obviously, I think I need to not introduce in any way WikiLeaks, um, another great example of data mining uh, journalism. And it's not just data mining, of course, in the case of WikiLeaks, um, but it's also um, data dissemination. So data mining, gathering data in new ways, gathering massive amounts of data in the case of uh, the diplomatic cables that were leaked, um, and making them available. Um, I think, again, I don't need to go over this too much because I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with the WikiLeaks story, um, but part of what WikiLeaks did was work with traditional old media uh, to do analysis of the data that they got. Um, so they really did perform the function of kind of a middleman, data holders, data disseminators, um, and then allowed other journalists and other commentators to do their analysis um, as they would. Um, although WikiLeaks has, of course, done other kinds of data dissemination where they did insert their own analysis, such as the collateral murder video. Um, and the reason why I wanted to emphasize earlier that point about how good journalism has from the beginning been about conscientious commentary is that a lot of people have tried to discredit the collateral, collateral murder video as well as many other kinds of journalism like that by saying that there's too much opinion injected. Uh, but in fact, injecting opinion is part of what journalists do. You don't have to agree, you don't have to think it's great, but that is part of the journalistic tradition. And I want to emphasize that because I think that <clears throat> WikiLeaks especially has really been scapegoated and demonized. And it's been used as a way of scapegoating and demonizing all kinds of new media and electronic media. Uh, and used, it's sort of been the, the paintbrush full of tar where people say, well, this stuff is irresponsible, it's espionage, it's pure opinion, you know, unlike other types of journalism which are never, never involving those things. Um, and I wanted to very quickly point out that in the United States at least, we have a long tradition of journalism that was called muckraking. Um, how many people have heard of muckraking journalism? Those of you who read 19th century literature. <laughs> um, so it was a type of journalism that started in the late 19th century. It was investigative journalists who would usually, um, through some form of um, covert behavior or misrepresentation, um, gain access to something like, for example, um, an insane asylum. The example that I have here is a very famous muckraking story done by um, a journalist named Nellie Bly, who had been hearing that um, conditions in a local women's in insane asylum were terrible. But as a journalist, she couldn't gain any access to find out. And as a journalist, they would, of course, only show her the nice parts of the insane asylum. So she pretended to be insane, she checked herself in, she went to a boarding house um, and started acting really crazy at the boarding house and accusing everybody at the boarding house of being insane. The police came, decided that she was insane and had her committed. Um, and she, this picture here is from the article that she actually uh, published called 10 Days in a Madhouse and that's her practicing insanity, um, <laughs> trying to make her hair messy or something. Um, and while she was there, she discovered that indeed the prisoners were being fed um, spoiled meat, raw bread, um, the violent prisoners were being tied up and hosed down with cold water, um, they were being beaten, they were being isolated, they were being, you know, they were living in their own shit. Um, it was basically as bad as you could possibly get um, without, you know, actually killing the prisoners out or killing the inmates outright. And as a result of her article, which you could claim was an article written entirely with the aim of changing public policy, 
okay? It wasn't just out there to be objective. She had a mission. She wanted to change the way these people were being treated. And as a result, um, several of the inmates were released after her article came out, people who were not insane but had simply been committed for being prostitutes or being poor um, because women who were prostitutes were often considered to be insane. Um, and also, uh, thousands and thousands of dollars were, were allocated by, New York, by the municipality of New York to this particular um, insane asylum to improve conditions. So basically, muckraking journalism, which then continued to flower throughout the early 20th century, and the famous book The Jungle by Upton Sinclair is also an example of muckraking, where he um, went into meatpacking houses, discovered that, surprise, meatpacking in 1906 was a very terrible practice, people were being injured all the time, and that actually led to a lot of uh, shifts in, in United States labor laws. Um, again, this, all this journalism was investigation done covertly. The journalist was not saying, hi, I'm a journalist. They were like, hi, I'm an insane person, or hi, I'm a meatpacker. Um, they got the information, they published it, and they did it with the aim of changing something about their community. Uh, in this case, changing something about US policy. So WikiLeaks is not a weird, aberrant new thing. It's part of a very long tradition of muckraking journalism. OK, here's another job I'm going to hire you for in 2060, which is whoops, crowd engineer. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but this is, a, this is a zombie flash mob here in Berlin. They're dancing. <laughs> um, <laughs> crowd engineers are people who edit and organize opinions and facts from masses of people. So if the data mining reporter is someone who kind of analyzes and organizes um, massive bodies of data, um, this is somebody who is gathering data from lots of people and organizing it and analyzing it. Um, this is something that, again, we're starting to see a lot of today. And, and as someone who runs a blog, I can say we need a lot more of it. Um, one example of how crowd engineering works, you can see on pretty much any site in the genre of Reddit or Dig um, or StumbleUpon or you know, name that site where people submit news items from other sources generally, and then through a process of weighted voting, uh, there is an algorithm that determines which stories rise to the top um, and become the most popular. And therefore, those stories really help to shape opinion, and they become much more read than they would have been. Uh, here on Reddit, on the Science Channel, you can see that um, human litter in space uh, is getting read a lot. Um, farm animals get 80% of antibiotics sold in the US. That's actually a pretty interesting story. Um, so what happens there, where you just have this automated opinion shaping going on, is that we're leaving the analysis of what stories are important to crowds, but also, more importantly, to algorithms, because you're not just I mean, anyone who's ever used DIG, which back when DIG was relevant, um, knows that you would vote on stuff, but it wasn't just how many votes a story got, right? Like, one story with 30 votes would get on the front page, one story with 500 votes wouldn't get on the front page, and that's because the votes were being weighted, and who voted mattered, and then later now they have this sort of incoherent system, which somewhat resembles Reddit's, where the stories that you see depend on whether your friends vote on them, which is just another way of weighting votes. Um, so you have basically algorithms which are determining which stories are the most important. Um, again, that's a perfect example of how journalism is going to get done, I think, more and more. Uh, or perhaps you could say that's how editing will get done, because it's traditionally been the job of the editor to determine what's on the front page. Now we're leaving that to, um, <laughs> to people who buy votes on DIG, um, which I've done uh, <clears throat> a long time ago. <laughs> um, the other thing, uh, uh, just to finish up with uh, crowd engineering, and then I'll, I'll kind of get into my conclusions, comment moderation. How many people here have been comment moderators in a forum? It's a pretty good number, yeah. This is a pretty active group socially online. So basically, here's what a comment moderator does. In a forum where people are talking, whether it's on io9, this is actually 
taken from um, a comment moderation screen on io9, which is the blog that I run. Um, they're either in a forum, they're on a blog, and basically they choose which comments may get banned, depending on the rules, or they choose um, you know, who is considered to be a trolling commenter or who's really a good commenter. Um, and again, it really depends on the forum. But um, just to speak really quickly to my experience with this, um, on, on io9 and actually on all of the blogs in the Gawker Media Network, which we're part of, um, we actually have the power to ban people right from the um, comment area. We can click on their name, and as you can see, I'm banning this person for trolling. I'm actually not banning that person. He actually made a really good comment. <laughs> this was just for the, this particular slide. Um, so you can ban people and mark them as trolls. You can move their comments up and down. As you can see here, highlighted in yellow, um, another user uh, who's a moderator promote, can promote a comment. So the comment goes from be being visible only to um, people who want to see every single comment uh, to um, anyone who's reading the blog. So basically, um, we have a system kind of like Slashdot where you can rate the comments, um, except we only have two numbers. So it's either featured comment or unfeatured comment. But you can set your threshold to see featured comments and unfeatured comments. Um, that was a lot of information that you probably didn't need to know. But my point is that comment moderators um, are incredibly important to shaping how we see what other people think. And again, remember, part of journalism's job is to give you facts about what people are thinking in your community so you can make decisions about how to behave in your community. Um, so there's a lot of power in the comment moderation. And the difference between comments on YouTube and comments on io9 is that YouTube has unmoderated comments. Um, and so you don't actually get, um, well, you do get a sense of what people think. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> The other thing is, crowd engineers, like many journalists and like many writers, not only give you news, but help inform you about social norms. And what's interesting is that, like different newspapers having different editorial points of view, um, different forums and different communities obviously have very different social norms. Um, so for example, you know, if you go to io9, you're going to see comments where we try to weed out the trolls, and anyone who makes a sexist comment, we ban them. Um, you know, sometimes we argue over what constitutes a sexist comment, but you know what I'm saying. Um, whereas if you go to 4chan's B um, <laughs> forum, here's a thought experiment. Imagine if a group of post-structuralist feminists did a flash mob on B. Okay, and we all went in there and we were like, dude, okay, we're going to like totally talk about Foucault and we're going to like deconstruct gender and we're going to talk about performative identity and we just flood the b-board and they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> so then what happens is because we're outside the norm of what's appropriate on B, so their moderators are going to come in and make sure that we get banned and they reinstitute fag jokes as soon as possible <laughs> to make sure... <laughs> So that's an example of crowd engineering. They're making the world, they're making their world safe for fag jokes, and other places are making the world safe for post-structuralist feminism. Um, and you know, I think there's a way in which there's kind of a crossover, but I don't know, that's not this talk. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let me finish up by talking about the future really quickly, and then we can have Q and A. Um, so the question is, I mean, I've sort of cut, come out of the gate saying like. Yes, we will have these jobs in 50 years. Journalism is not going away. I can guarantee you, you'll be working as a journalist in 50 years if you choose and if you take life extension drugs and are still hale and hearty at that time. Um, part of the reason why I think that that's true and part of the reason I, I deeply believe that this, is, that this is a picture of our future or a, a hazy view of our future is that each of these jobs that I've described has a, a rich historical precedent. These aren't jobs that just appeared out of nowhere. They're not like, suddenly we had WikiLeaks and journalism was different. As I already pointed out, um, these data mining reporters of the sort we see with WikiLeaks have a history with muckraking journalism, which has a very, you know, over a century um, of, of tradition behind it. Um, 
I would also argue that the hacker journalists that I talked about with the people who developed the Ushahidi mapping platform also have a very long history behind them. Um, a really great example is when photography was first used in the service of journalistic reporting. Um, during the Civil War in the United States, which was in the mid-19th century, <clears throat> um, photography was a very young technology. It was very difficult to do. It required a big lab. It required really huge, bulky equipment. Um, and people hadn't really been using it very much for, for very much more than portraiture. Um, a photographer named Matthew Brady decided, I am going to use this new technology to report on what's happening in the Civil War. So he went down to the southern United States, went to some of the battlefields, very famous battlefields in Virginia and other states, set up a giant tent and created a chemistry lab where he could develop film and send, it, send his pictures back to newspapers in New York. And his images of the Civil War, um, you can look him up on Google, Matthew Brady, um, spelled kind of oddly um, with one T. His photographs became iconic. He took pictures of dead soldiers in the trenches. Um, these were images that ordinary citizens had really never seen before unless they'd actually been in a battlefield themselves. And he really brought home to people what did it mean to be fighting in this long war with very little money and very little food. And these images of the bodies just stretched out along you know, the edges of farmlands, basically, places where people had been living um, until quite recently, really did change and shape people's understanding of war. And so that was over 150 years ago that we had essentially an early hacker journalist who said, I'm going to take this new technology and change the way reporting is done. And now we can't even imagine war reporting without photography. How could you even do that? Uh, but at that time, it was incredibly new. Um, and finally, I would argue that crowd engineers, these people who are making sure that we don't have feminism on 4chan, um, also have <clears throat> a very early, early um, precedent with people who are pollsters, like they take polls of people and take the temperature of a community to find out who people are thinking of voting for, what movie they think they might want to see, um, also, census takers, um, there's a long history of taking census data going back thousands of years. Um, some of our earliest uh, documents from civilizations are census data, you know, how many people live in a city. Um, that's, that's a way of figuring out who the community is um, and who gets counted in a census and who doesn't get counted in a census is, a, is an early form of moderation. Um, and also, uh, I mentioned here at the very end, letters editors. Uh, what I mean by that is people who edit paid, like, letters to the editor, parts of newspapers, which again, that's kind of an early version of something like Dig, where you know, people write in and they're like, this is a really important news about chickens in my, my small area. Um, and then the editor decides, should chicken news be on the front page? Why, yes. Um, we want chicken news. But I do think that, I mean, obviously, these are not, you know, the pollster is not the same as the crowd engineer. Early war photography is not the same thing as WikiLeaks. And so what we, we are seeing a shift in how these jobs are done. And I think that as we head into the future, um, we're going to see these things become much more crucial. The thing is that pretty much every generation has worried about the death of journalism. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, people worried that newspaper sensationalism and muckraking was destroying journalism. All these crazy people with their progressive ideas inserting their commentary into stories about the madhouse. Um, people worried in the mid-century, in the mid-20th century, that fluff journalism and personal writing was destroying journalism. Later in the 1960s, when people like Hunter S. Thompson started taking drugs and writing about going to Las Vegas and calling it journalism, people said, journalism is dying. No one's ever going to do journalism again. Um, not only do all these types of journalism have a history, but the fear that journalism is dying has a long history. Um, at the very beginning of what we think of as journalistic history, which is in the 18th century, 
people were upset about journalism in general because suddenly you didn't have just people writing things that were basically a propaganda machine for the king. And suddenly there were journalists who were taking opinions separate from that. Um, so even then, there was a concern that now we no longer got to hear directly from the king. We had to read these broadsheets that um, criticized him or her, well, him. Um, <clears throat> so really what I want to end with is saying that we're not seeing the end of journalism. We're just seeing a change in how journalism is being done. We're seeing a change in the technologies that we're using to do a lot of the same things that we've been doing for hundreds of years. And yes, some people are going to suffer during this transition. Um, people have lost their jobs, but the enterprise of journalism is not in danger. The, the idea of the work of the journalist, which is serving the public by bringing factual information and conscientious opinions to people so that they can decide for themselves what to think about what's happening in their communities, that's still going on. That's not going to change. We are going to have journalism in the future, and we are going to continue to have journalism that provides an independent monitor of power as well. So I think we can have Q&A. <clears throat> So if people want to ask questions, I think there are mic microphones here, and there's a human with a microphone. <laughs> and do you have a, does the angle have a question? Okay, we're going to take a question from the chat room. Okay, I actually have um, two questions from the internet. The first one is from Australia and they want to know what your thoughts are on the future of legal protections for journalists. Okay, the question is um, the future of legal protections for journalists. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, so in many countries um, or states within countries, there are protections that uh, prevent journalists from being arrested for what they're reporting, um, even if what they're reporting could be argued to compromise some kind of state secret or compromise corporate secrecy in some way. Um, each of these laws tends to be localized, so protections that journalists have in one country differ from another country. And what's happening as we transition into this new set of tools for doing journalism is that we're seeing journalism that is crossing national lines more and more and more. We've certainly always had journalism that crossed national lines, but now we have things, for example, like WikiLeaks, where there's no, there's no obvious place that it's located. So there's no obvious state whose legal authority um, could, I mean, plenty of states will argue that they have legal authority over it, I'm not saying that. Um, but I'm just saying that it becomes a more difficult legal question. So I think what we're gonna see is a very, very messy transition. Um, Perhaps we'll see international bodies spring up to deal with journalism that isn't uh, tied to a particular nation, or in a dystopian future, maybe we'll just see those rights uh, eroded, and we'll see journalists having to take their lives in their hands um, much more often than they do now. Um, so I'm hoping for something that's a more diplomatic solution where maybe countries like, maybe you could get the whole EU uh, agreeing on certain, actually I don't know if, does the EU have a shared, um, shared protections I, for reporters? I don't know. But maybe you could have an international body like the UN, which determines, um, an international body with actual power um, that determines uh, how journalists are treated. But yeah, right now it's in chaos and I think it is a really dangerous time. Okay. Um, so the next question is, how are you thinking about the financial options for journalists in the future? financial options. Um, well, as I said uh, at the beginning of this talk, um, these are jobs that people will have in the future. Um, every single example that I gave involved organizations where people are being paid to do those jobs that I described, even if the way they're being paid is through donations. Um, but in many cases, they're not being paid through donations. There's plenty of people like me, bloggers, who are actually being paid through just companies. 
Um, so I think we're going to see people get paid for this stuff. Um, sometimes it'll be the old model of subscriptions. Sometimes it'll be through the new model of advertising, which isn't actually a very new model for news because television news, of course, has been supported by advertising for decades. Um, and in fact, when that happened, there was a huge amount of panic that suddenly advertisers would influence the news, um, which of course happened. Um, and, um, but also, there is still television news that does do good reporting as well. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot more ad-supported um, news as well as um, donation-supported news. Hi. Hi. Um, how will journalistic authority be determined in 2050? And will it still matter? The question is about how will journalistic authority be determined? Um, well, the way that journalistic authority is determined now is that a small group of people who control a small number of media outlets hire people from the schools that they went to uh, and determine, based on publishing them, publishing them in mainstream media outlets, that they are authorities, right? So right now, when you say, I think the New York Times is an authority, uh, despite the fact that they've published lies, it's been proven that they publish lies and that they hire people who don't do reporting. Um, you know, it kind of undermines the idea that we ever really had journalistic authority other than just what we choose to believe in. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that I think that journalistic integrity or journalistic authority um, will continue along just fine. Um, people will not necessarily be able to get jobs at newspapers with a 200-year history behind them or a giant brand machine behind them. Um, but basically, we will, we will determine authority the way we do now. I mean, many of us in the United States, when we watch Fox News, even though that is considered an authority by many people, we don't consider it an authority because we think, well, they have a right-wing bias and they report things that are ridiculous. Um, and then other people think of The Daily Show as authority, even though it's a humor show. Um, and why is that? Well, it's because over time we determine, well, as we've watched this show, we agree with it. Um, or we, we think it actually breaks news. Um, so I'm not too worried about it. I think that, like I said, people will continue on assigning our authority to news sources pretty much arbitrarily. Sometimes it will be deserved. Sometimes it absolutely won't be deserved. Sometimes people who are true journalistic authorities, no one will pay attention to because they don't have flashy branding and they don't have a corporate entity behind them. And that's just how it is now, too. And that's how it was 50 years ago. And it's, you know, it's a broken system in that way. And I think we're going to muddle along with the same broken stuff. Sorry, that was kind of dark, but um, <laughs> that is how it is. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So we have oh. another question from the internet, which is, um, how do you think that we can speed up the development of these social engineering jobs, and which institutions would be interested as investors for such projects? OK, how can, the question is, how can we speed up the development of crowd engineering jobs? I think that the questioner said social engineering jobs. I think we all already know how to get money from social engineering. Um, <laughs> you guys attended this conference. Um, so um, how do we speed up crowd engineering jobs? How do we get more of them? How do we encourage institutions um, to fund them? Um, that's a good question. Um, even at my organization, it's been very hard to argue for full-time people who are doing um, crowd engineering and comment moderation. Um, I think that the way that you argue for it is you basically present many different use cases and you say, well, here is a site that has really good comment moderation. Here's a foreign forum with really good comment moderation. Look, they have many, many more millions of people going there and reading their comments than this site, which doesn't have good comment moderation. That's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it is to start doing the job. Another way to do it and, and to sort of show as part of your job you're doing this um, you know, I'm writing, I'm moderating, look how much of my time this is taking, don't you think that someone else should be paid to do it? That actually works. Um, that is a tried and true method. Um, and I think also it's going to be 
a lot of these jobs are going to come out of um, organizations that aren't traditional news organizations. So it'll be places like comment forums for, um, for products where, for example, you've downloaded a piece of software, they have a comment forum, you ask a question, and there's a reliable moderator who actually answers. That does happen sometimes. I know it sounds crazy, um, but sometimes you actually, there are paid people that will respond to your complaints about your T-Mobile phone, um, and they aren't just bots. Um, and then the final thing I would say is that a lot of people are developing automated tools to do moderation which is problematic, but that is another area where those jobs exist, is developing automated tools to do comment moderation. So how can we speed it up? I don't know, but I think it's happening. Yeah. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your interesting um, talk. Thanks. But I um, have a question. Since you uh, described the methods of, uh, of how to do journalism, uh, like um, data mining and so on, um, and you said that journalism is dying, this is bullshit. But don't you think that like the people who are doing today journalism and maybe using yeah, Word to write their text and then they are happy to use the content management system of their website, um, that they are maybe not able to um, yeah, say, oh, let's do some data mining or so. So um, that we have some kind of demise of the like old journalists and that there is a new type of people who are able to utilize all these methods you described uh, to do journalism so that we have a, in fact, the shift. So you described the methods, but not that maybe the people who are doing that are a different kind of people than the people who are doing that today. Um, absolutely, yes. So. Um People who did traditional journalism, which was just, say, writing in a document or consulting with other people, um, though that is exactly why we've seen, uh, in the United States at least, and probably throughout the world, a huge number of journalism jobs have been lost over the past couple of years, um, or have been downsized or eliminated, uh, precisely because we're seeing the importance of new kinds of tools. So we need people who can use those tools and who can do that kind of analysis. However, um, for example, in all, actually, both of the data mining examples I gave, both for the Nanex analyst and for WikiLeaks, uh, the, the folks who were doing that analysis worked with traditional journalists who use open office or whatever. Um, and so there's still a need for people who can write and who can express themselves in an organized way and in a persuasive way. Um, data doesn't speak for itself. It, it can make a pretty chart, but if I had shown you that chart of just the little triangles going up and down without telling you the story behind it, it would have been like, wow, neat triangle chart, awesome. Um, so I think that there's a need for both, but I absolutely agree that we are going to see a dying out of certain kinds of jobs and a rise of other jobs, but journalism itself will remain intact. Talking about feminist rates and fortune, did you do you actually think this is possible? Because, um, yeah, a waiting bee, especially fortune bee, would just get flooded out. Um, so the question is, would my thought experiment about a feminist invasion of 4chan's um, forum be actually be possible? Um, well, we could try it. <laughs> <laughs> I would say we could try it and that would be fun, but I would also say um, one of the reasons why, despite what all of my friends say, I still have a lot of respect for 4chan and a lot of even respect for B is because they have really good comment moderation. And the reason I say that is because they have a particular kind of community, they've made a safe space for trolling, and they enforce it, okay? I mean, they are able to keep the tone going. And you laugh, but that's not easy. Like, it's just as hard to enforce a tone of constant trolling and constant fag jokes as it is to enforce a tone of high-minded discourse. They both require work, and they require community collaboration, or community chaos collaboration. Um, and, and so I think we would lose in the end. I think we would have a really fun time, like flash mobbing them, and we could take over for a little bit, but I think we would lose because I think that their community moderation is so good because they would just revert to troll. So that's um, my prediction, but I would love to be proven wrong. That would be really fun. And I think they would like it too. I think they would have fun. <laughs> I 
I don't think you would need moderation to keep uh, bad image board just bad because uh, B is mostly other shit and well, you don't need moderation for this. It, it just moderates itself. It just, I'm sorry, what? It just moderates itself because uh, unbound threads die in about 10 minutes. So anything which is about quality just uh, yeah, won't survive there. Mm -hmm. That's a form of moderation though. I mean, it's, it's still moderation, even if it's chaos. Um, like I said, it's hard to maintain constant chaos. I think we can, in B fashion, we can agree to disagree and kill the thread. <laughs> um, yes, I'm coming from far up in the northern parts of Sweden, and uh, well, there's not a lot of people there, so this whole crowdsourcing part for those kind of areas would probably not work for local news. Uh, I mean, I accept that you might get a job working at a far, uh, far away place, but uh, how are the local less interesting news going to be produced and distributed if you have these systems of, well, the moderations that you speak of, or will there perhaps be just a whole lot of systems that, that solve it? Um, so I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the question is how would you have good crowdsourced and crowd engineered journalism for local areas where there's not a very big crowd? Um, so I would say actually local areas, even with a small crowd, um, are, actually, are ripe for crowdsourced journalism. Um, because you still do want news from your local area. The question of whether you could be paid to gather news from like 500 people about, um, you know, whatever news is happening in, in the region, like lots of snow or like everybody, you know, is staying up really late because it's, you know, daytime for 24 hours. Um, I think uh, you might not be able to get a job out of that. Although, if, every, if all of your neighbors really enjoyed getting your news, maybe they would all put in some money um, you know, and, and actually ask you to f uh, continue doing it. Uh, but I think more likely what you'll see are much bigger collections of local news. So you might have a site or a series of sites like what we have now with um, you know, many city, city blogs where people are providing information, but there's a giant network of, of blogs that are about local areas. So your crowd engineer might be moderating 20 different cities in the north of Sweden. And so it wouldn't just be that one. Um, but I definitely think that, that crowdsourcing makes local news actually much more, a, a much better proposition because you can actually get it from people who are in the local area. Um, you just need a moderator, somebody who will weed out the radio requests and the spam and things like that. So we have another question from the internet, which is, um, do you think there has to be more self-control in the new journalism, especially around leaks? More self-control in the new journalism around leaks. Um, that's, I mean, that's kind of a contextual question. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what self-control means. I, I suppose what they're saying is if you get a bunch of sensitive information, should you just keep it secret instead of reporting it? Um, I think that's obviously true. I mean, if somebody sends you a bunch of health records for people in your northern Swedish town, that's not a really great thing to post on your local blog. Um, so I think if that's the kind of leak you're talking about, then yeah, I mean, it's obvious that you don't want to publish that. Um, but if it's a leak that is actually relevant to the broader community, like if it's leaked diplomatic cables that actually shed light on contemporary international conflicts, um, then I think that new media journalists have to ask themselves the same questions that traditional journalists always did. You know, should I publish this? You know, will people's lives be in danger if I publish it? You have to ask yourself really hard questions. Is the good of the community knowing worth putting people in danger whose secrets I'm going to be releasing? Journalists do ask themselves those questions all the time. And so now a new generation of people will be asking themselves those questions about new kinds of leaked information, or maybe old kinds of leaked information brought to them via new kinds of channels. Um, so I think it's really going to depend. I don't think there's such a thing as more self-control. I think there's different situations where hard questions will have to be asked, 
And they're not always going to be the same questions we asked with WikiLeaks. They're going to be other kinds of questions. Like I said, health information type stuff. Like, that could actually become relevant. Um, so I think, yeah, there's going to be the new generation of journalists is going to have to learn what it's like to have blood on their hands if they're going to report the news. And that's going to happen sometimes. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, what are you thinking about the kind of raw journalism WikiLeaks does at this moment? I mean, it publishes a whole bunch of information and everyone can think they're part of it. And do you think this kind of journalism has a big future? Um, so currently, most of what WikiLeaks has done um, that's gotten a lot of media attention has often been, been through some kind of editorial process. There's been some um, expurgation, you know, some information is removed, um, there's interpretations placed on it, um, but then some of it has been sort of raw, like here's addresses of people, um, which was actually taken down eventually. Um, I think there is a future for that kind of I do. I think there is a future for places like WikiLeaks that encourage people to send them secret information and will post it. I think there's going to be other groups in the wake of WikiLeaks that will be far less interested in going to the media first, like going to, you know, Der Spiegel and saying, please look through this stuff and help us interpret it. There's going to be other places where they're just going to say, let's just put it up there. We don't even care. Like, we don't, we don't even want to talk to old school journalists. So we're going to see, you know, we're going to see more, perhaps even more dangerous leaking. But yeah, I, I definitely think that's going to become part of how journalism is done. Yeah. Okay, there's time for one last question and answer, uh, provided it takes less than a minute. Yeah, um, okay. So uh, maybe, maybe that's also to sum it all up. I sort of noticed or thought I noticed in your, in your speech that um, in the past journalism was more about finding out things and adding to a certain amount so it's more an additive sort of form of journalism while what you proposed or uh, foresaw is uh, more sort of a subst subtractive uh, sort of thing like data mining, getting into things, getting, uh, getting information out of lots and lots, lots and lots of data. Is that sort of what, what you would sort of summarize it all so that journalism is, sh journalism is shifting more uh, to a subtractive form of, of, of working? No, I don't, I don't think okay. so at all. I mean, I think it's both. I mean, I think that the act of data mining, first of all, that adds information to your data especially once you start interpreting it. I don't think that that's subtractive at all. And I think you could even argue that old school muckraking was a form of data mining. You know, you sneak into a mental institution and you take notes. You're gathering data on what's happening to these people that are in the, in the mental institution. So I think taking already existing data that's in the world versus taking data that's in a database, I don't, I don't really see, I think that those are different actions, but I think that ultimately, as a journalist, you're taking data and you're interpreting it, um, and you're and probably putting your opinion, putting a spin on it. I mean, objective journalism is almost impossible. It's, it's really not a real thing. Um, so yeah, I think we're going to keep data mining as we have been, and you won't be able to stop the signal, as they say in Firefly. <laughs> I just got told that there's still time for some additional questions, so <laughs> apologies for my uh, remark earlier. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. May yeah. Hi. Um, I'm a photographer and I wanted to know how do you see the future of photojournalism or also uh, video journalists? Uh, not only, I mean, I'm not talking about only still photography, but in general image. I think generation. that um, the future of photojournalism and video journalism is huge. Um, I think a lot of what was once reporting like in a notebook is now, now journalists will be expected to be taking video and photographs while they're reporting. So it used to be old school, 
I would go someplace, like Wired Magazine would send me someplace, and I would write things down, and there'd be a photographer with me taking pictures. That won't happen anymore. I think it'll be me taking pictures, me taking notes. So I think, and because of the fact that, <laughs> because of the fact that the media that we're working in are so visual and also allow for video, it's going to be huge, bigger than before. Okay, Emily, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay.